know, so we had a 10 year bull market uh, in resource stocks from 2002 to 2012. Um, and there was an amazing time, but again, it mm-hmm. wasn't straight up. There was many times during that 10 year bull market that we were shaking our heads saying, wow, is this bull market over? But then next, next thing you know, it keeps going higher. Keith Newmeyer is a respected name in the precious metal sector. He's the CEO of First Majestic Silver, but he also founded a gold company back in 2015, First Mining Gold. He still serves as the chairman, and today we have the honor of having Keith join us to talk about gold, talk about the general gold equity market, and specifically about First Mining Gold and the attractive opportunity that the share price now offers. Keith, welcome to Ron's Basement. Well, it's great to see you again, Ron. It's been quite some time. Yeah, it's great. Great to have you back in the basement. So what do you think about the gold price uh, right now, Keith? Are you uh, are you happy with what you're seeing? What are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, we, we sold some gold yesterday. When I say we, I mean First, first Majestic. Uh, you know, we're, we're producing gold and silver, so of course we have to um, uh, sell our metal um, as, as, as part of our our business, of course, and it's nice to sell it at these kinds of prices. Um, it is surprising how quickly it's moved, um, mm-hmm. uh, and then and, and you know, but I guess you know, with all the geo- geopolitical events that that are underway, and you know, the central banks have become a such a large buyer. I, I listened to a podcast the other day that one of the gold council members said that sixty five percent of all world production of gold right now is going to central banks. Well, that was an enormous number, if that's correct. Um, uh, so there's a huge bid under the market right now uh, by big sticky buyers, and uh, we haven't seen that for a long time. And uh, for probably 30 years, we haven't seen that. So it's really nice to see. Um, it was something we've been waiting for for a long time. Yeah, and uh, and I think it's important to point out as well that if the Western investors show back up to the market, because you know all the technical data shows that the the Western um, uh, institutional and retail investors have been quite subdued. If they were to show up, that could be you know even you know a much larger additional uh, source of demand for for gold as well. Well, I know we're going to get into talking about equities and, and first mining, of course, but you know that. That goes to really the absence of the investor, uh, the North American investor. And, uh, you know, I've been in this market for a long time. And I remember back in the 90s when, you know, I'm running around raising money for First Quantum Minerals. And, and uh, you know, you had pension funds, Canadian pension fund, you had insurance companies, uh, a variety of pension funds who you could rely on who w- would write checks uh, for financing for, you know, projects around the world. And, uh including, you know, all the projects that were being financed back then. It was the same investors, mostly pension funds, really sticky money. Um, all these funds, all these pension funds, um, including the government pension funds, you know, had a portion of their money, their their assets in metals, um, gold, silver, copper, whatever uh, the case may be. And um, today, these funds have zero allocation to metals. Uh, they've actually got very little allocation to energy, period, as well. Um, so it, it's quite unusual because, um, you know, they, they must be, these fund managers that, that are running these trillions of dollars around the world in all these pension funds that have no investment in this sector at all, they must be, you know, really getting a little bit nervous now because uh, this is going to be the best performing sector, I think, over the next five plus years. And uh, we, we, without with them not having exposure, it's going to be you know job job crushing. A lot of these guys are going to get fired, and uh, uh, <clears throat> so they're going to have they're going to be forced to come into this market just because of what what we're seeing today. Yeah, and it, and it could be like a a flood of money because um, you know the the total market cap of the precious metals mining sector is quite small right now compared to, you know, let's just compare it to Apple Computers market cap or any of these uh, companies that have garnered so much attention uh, that that if we get just a small portion of what you talked about, it could result in uh, big, big moves uh, for the mining stocks in particular. So I want to ask you about the mining stocks. Do you, I find myself uh, oftentimes 
uh, because I do invest a lot in mining stocks, kind of exacerbated, frustrated that we've seen, especially with gold, great moves in gold, but there's this massive disconnect um, with the mining stocks. And I think it's set up a very attractive, you know, potential for 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 capital appreciation down the road. But right now, do you see it as a as a very opportunistic pricing environment for the uh, for the for the mining stocks, the entire sector? Well, it depends if you're a mining company or an, or an investor. Uh, you know, if you look at and I've got a portfolio of uh, mining stocks, including First Mining and and you know, of course, First Majestic and others. But um, um, you know, they they've not really performed great. You know, uh, mm -hmm. First Majestic's up maybe. Um, I don't know, twenty percent uh, over over the last you know three months. Call it, uh, you know, first mining is basically flat. Um, you know, I've got a number of uh, other companies in my portfolio that are maybe flat to maybe up ten percent. Uh, so so the the market is turning around, but there's a big reluctance of investors out there to really start allocating capital to the sector. And uh, you know, I I don't really know all the reasons. It could be ESG related. It could be you know, uh, 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 you know, risk related, you know, I, I think that, you know, what happened in Panama, um, uh, you know, was a, a quite a negative uh, situation for a lot of big investors. They look at that and they go, wow, you know, uh, uh, land tenure, you know, claim, claim issues or, or whatever the case may be. And, you know, other countries around the world are, are putting clamps on mining as well. Even here in Canada, you know, the, 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 you know, the Trudeau government doesn't like extractive industries. So there's, you know, a move around the world that, um, you know, ex extractive industries are somehow, you know, bad, which is completely nonsense. Uh, I think the mining sector is probably, um, you know, one of the most cleanest sectors in the world. Um, and people might be surprised to hear that, but, uh, you know, the yeah. U.S. and Canadian and Australian miners are are so on top of, of environmental issues that, uh, you know, people, it's unfortunate that, you know, mining executives around the world don't pat themselves on the back a little bit more to really garner the the um, uh, uh, you know recognition that they deserve. But you know, you get caught in you know this political environment where politicians find it easier to allow Le Levi's manufacturer to open up in their backyard, and it's just going to you know pay minimum wage you know to a bunch of slave laborers to create genes, and you know that gene company can just up and go if they don't like the environment. You know after the government has built, you know, roads and infrastructure and, you know, and even in some cases built towns, you know, to, to, to bring, you know, these types of manufacturers in, into their um, area. Um, yeah, the miner, you know, has to build it all itself and, and, and is, is there for the next 30, 40, 50 years, you know, at the, at the mercy of the government. So, um, and then the miners put up with it and, uh, um, you know, we were, we're, you know, long-term players in this sector and, uh, you know, we, uh, it's nice to see the prices doing what they're doing because it's going to allow us to reinvest capital and put capital into some important assets around the world and create more employment and, uh, you know, bring some of these metals to the market that uh, are, are very critical to, to uh, uh, consumers. Yeah. So if we if we focus in on first mining gold, you founded the company in 2015. Um I was thinking before we went on here, if I if I told you back in 2015 that that we'd be talking today and the gold price would be at two thousand two hundred sixty dollars per ounce, uh, would you have believed me? And would you have believed that? And again, this is not something specific to first mining gold; it's the entire sector that there'd be such an opportunity right now for investors to get in at at what appears to be very very attractive entry points. Well, first mining was the darling of of House Street. You know, House Street is a major financial street in, in Vancouver, Canada, mm -hmm. it's where most of the brokerage firms and most of the mining companies exist. And uh, um, uh, so, you know, I remember when I was putting the company together, um, you know, back in 2014, 2015, it, I, I, it came public in early 2015 and uh, I was raising money and buying assets and, you know, from uh, early 2015 into early 2016, uh, the gold price fortunately started to move. And, uh, you know, I was full on acquiring assets at dirt cheap prices as far as I was concerned and uh, buying good quality assets that no one really wanted to finance. And we ended up with 
a pretty darn good portfolio. Um, the stock was trading every day for probably 12 months. I have to go back and look at the exact data, but just from memory, uh, it was in the top 10 trading companies on the on the uh, TSX Venture Exchange for pretty well every day for a period of 12 months. And uh, uh, we raised a lot of money. We had a market cap of over $600 million at the peak. Um, and uh, the assets that we bought uh, as far as I'm concerned, you know, became one of the uh, best quality gold portfolios there is in the space. And I don't know of another junior company that owns such a portfolio as, as First Mining Gold. And, you know, we were able to do that because these junior companies, they're all single asset companies. And I'm not a huge fan of single asset companies because they always seem to be, you know, run into a ripple now and then. So, you know, I, I like to have multi-asset companies and that's what I built with first mining and then uh um these companies that we bought had run out of money uh their market caps were quite low management had you know thrown in the towel basically and uh we are to put this package together of you know eight companies saying which are you know are, are, are you know we've sold portions of some of them off but uh, you know our two core assets spring pole and du parquet has become our primary drivers of you know our future success or at least what we consider to be our future success so it's pretty exciting, um, um, but today, you know, we have a market cap of, I don't know, 120 million or something, and uh, <laughs> and these assets are much more advanced than they were, you know, back, you know, eight years ago when we first put this company together. So um, I think it's, you know, it's dirt cheap, and I was, I, I've been a buyer. I'm approaching uh, 30 million shares uh, of of uh, uh, that I personally own. I'm, I'm buy, I buy, I think virtually every month I buy some more stock. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You'll see my insider trading and, and uh, you know, I, I think the stock is, you know, is, is easily a five bagger. I know it's probably not supposed to say that kind of thing, but uh, mm -hmm. in, in my view, that's the kind of, you know, um, uh, upside I believe it has. Yeah. Yeah, well, Bob, I'll say it's a six bagger. That way, I'll get you out of trouble. If anybody's going to take the heat for that one, um, uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it, it, it's it's an interesting situation as, as I look at the two major projects, right? Spring Pole multi million ounce project in Canada, Du Parquet, right, which was just recently kind of uh, consolidated uh, about a year and a half ago um, uh, in, in in Quebec both of which are multi-million ounce projects in Canada. And then there's four additional projects. Uh, I know Cameron, the company still owns 100% of uh, big position in treasury metals, uh, the Pickle Crow project, and then uh, with Big Ridge, I think the, the company still owns 20% of that. These are big gold projects in Canada and um, that are moving, well, in the case of Spring Pole and Duparquet, moving through the development process uh, so catalyst rich environment as we move into the next couple of years. But I want to ask you a question, Keith, uh, about a, another catalyst that we might see uh, for development stage companies in Canada. And that is, I keep hearing that the big major producers, that their pipelines are um, are running a little thin, that over the last 10 years, they didn't invest a lot in exploration. They didn't invest a lot in uh, development stage projects. So as we look out, let's say over the next two, three, four years, you have a situation where First Mining has two big projects in Canada that could be uh, nearing the, uh, uh, the, the, the permitting process being completed at about the same time that we could have some big companies who are going to be in the market to buy projects that are at that stage? Is that is that a fair assessment? Is that a, a, one of the catalysts that maybe you look at is something that could be exciting here in the next few years? Well, absolutely, and uh, you know we we still haven't seen a lot of move, you know, a lot of activity. Um, uh, you know, B two Gold recently bought um, uh, I forget the name of the company up in northern uh, Canada. Uh, there's been a couple other acquisitions um, over the last 12 months, but it's been pretty quiet. Um, uh, but I think you've got to see that speed up. Uh, you know, these juniors like the first minings uh, uh, out there. Uh, there, they they haven't moved much. Uh, the majors have moved, you know, propor uh, out proportionally because you know the money has started coming into the sector. So the first mining is always going to going to be going to the majors. 
know, the new monster the barracks and, you know, and Inco Eagles and, and so on and so forth, you know. Um, and then and as their market cap increases and as the pressure starts coming to them because the institutions who are buying their stock, so you know, say to management, hey, look, your market cap's, you know, gone up 50% in the last, uh, you know, six to 12 months. You know, what are you doing? Like, you know, why aren't you out there buying some of these juniors who are, you know, struggling and uh, you know, needing capital and uh, have good projects? So that's, we're just at the beginning of that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it'll be interesting to watch the next 12 months. Uh, you know, I, 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 I don't run the day-to-day -day management of the first mining gold. You know, Dan Walton, the CEO, does all that. I'm the chairman of the company. So, and then I obviously don't want to disclose, um, you know, details, you know, over a podcast of, you know, what's going on behind the scenes. But, you know, I could tell you that, you know, there's always talk. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, at First Majestic, for example, you know, I am the CEO of that company. And, uh, you know, we're always looking for juniors. We're always looking for places. How, how do we expand our production? How do we get more silver uh, into our portfolio? And, uh, you know, if we're doing it, you know, I can tell you the other majors are doing it in the gold sector as well. And, uh, you know, I've got evidence that is happening. But, you know, it does take two to tango and you never know when the transaction occurs. Uh, quite frankly, at 13 cents a share, I'm not a, you know, avid seller. So <laughs> right. you know, I, I, I would like to see things improve a little bit more before, you know, we start going down that path. If you're looking to buy gold, silver, or platinum, do yourself a favor and check out Pimbex, the online precious metals bullion dealer and sponsor of Ron's Basement. I was a happy customer before they offered to support the channel. You'll find they have the best prices, quality, and service. I think Pimbex is best, and you will too. And be sure to tell them that you're from Ron's Basement. And I think it's important to point out too, these majors over the last 10 years, the reason they weren't doing as much exploration and development work is because they were working on building really strong balance sheets, paying off debt. And right now, I mean, Keith, heck, if if gold, if the gold price stays above twenty two hundred dollars, I mean, the, the the big producers were really happy with two thousand dollar gold. I would think the amount of cash that they're generating at some at some point they're going to run out of debt to pay off. Uh, they're going to need to do something with that money. Uh, and just at the at the time again when their pipeline uh, of their their resources, I I heard something a few few weeks ago. Uh, someone mentioned that the major gold mining companies now compared to 10 years ago, that their level of resources was down by like 30 to 40 percent. Um, you know, so so it just, you know, I think as we look at the catalyst, as we move into the next couple years for first mining, uh, you know, I, I think there's uh, some, some some interesting developments that could occur. And I appreciate you uh, giving us light. Another one, uh, money could come just back into the sector, right? I mean, even independent of this high gold price, just more money coming back in, Um you know, the, the permitting process, uh, I don't know, I know Dan Wilton uh, obviously runs the company, but it feels like, and I think I heard him say this recently, that like spring pole is almost 75, 80% through the permitting process. I know there's some big milestones coming up. Will the stock move? And of course, we're not giving financial advice and neither of us can predict the future. But has it been your experience, you know, I think a lot of times people wait, like, oh, I want to wait until this happens, until I buy the stock. But isn't it usually the case that a lot of times the stocks move in anticipation of big catalyst events? Does that does that make sense? Well, for sure. You know, the market's not stupid. Um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the market kind of knows what's going on. And, um, uh, you, you know, you never know what catalyst is going to drive a stock. Um you know, it, there's it as usually uh, it's it's probably rarely one catalyst. Um, yeah, it's it's a multiple of different things coming together all at the same time, and then the market just wakes up and says, "Hey, the stock is cheap," and they and they and then the market comes into and floods into that stock, and next thing you know, it's up you know three, four, five hundred percent, and people go back and say, "How did that happen?" Well, sure. we've been talking we've been talking about this for the last five years. We told you it was going to happen. And and you haven't listened and and blah 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 right so you have that discussion and then people kick themselves you know on, on, and say shoot I should have you know bought some or I should have bought more and you know, I don't know how many times I've had that discussion with investors you know throughout my career you know um, you know first quantum I was 
you know, there were many years where we were struggling trying to raise money. And uh, um, uh, uh, at first Majestic, you know, the, the same kind of thing, you know, it, it's that we, we went through 20 years in September of 2023, um, um, our 20th year anniversary. And, and it wasn't all, you know, fun and games over that 20 years. Uh, there's a lot of hard times, a lot of sweat, a lot of, you know, uh, 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 you know, focus from the management team to, you know, get through difficult times and, you know, you know continually build a business. And the same thing is going on at First Mining Gold. You know, there's, you know, the burn at First Mining is quite high. You know, to permit a gold project, you know, in Ontario or Quebec, it's not a cheap process. You've got to go mm-hmm. through it. You got to keep financing it, and you just got to keep plugging it out and plugging it out and plugging it out, and and eventually, you know, the market says, "Hey, these guys might actually have a chance to get that." You know, uh, five years ago, I, I I would probably guess that many many people would have thought, you know, or bet it against us, you know, and and then as as people start to bet with us, then that's yeah. where you start to see things change, and uh, it's going to happen. You know, the gold price, of course, will help, but um, you know, other things will help, but I think it's a lot of just attitude as well. Um, you know, people are still making money on Nvidia and you know, uh, you know, Apple and Nike, whatever. You know, they're they're still making. You know, look at the S and P. You know, what what it's done over the last uh, you know three months is shocking. You know, the this is the you know the biggest market in the world. I mean, you don't, you don't yeah. see markets like that move like that. So, you know, why why would you invest? In, in the resource sector, really, you know, you look at the GDX and it's uh, with, with gold where it's trading at, GDX has to go up, I think, 100% to <clears> get its old highs. Um, yeah. So, you know, the, the the mining sector, it's not exactly screaming uh, to invest in us. But, you know, once, you know, and I've said this many times and you've heard me say this, Ron, but, uh, um, you know, back in 2000, when the, when the NASDAQ hit 5,000 in March of 2000, and then over the next three years, it dropped 80%. You know, the NASDAQ went from 5,800. <laughs> you know, think about that. Um, and, right. and where did all that money go? It all went into the resource sector and, well, and real estate as well. So, um, so in the resource sector is so small, you know, so we had a 10-year bull market uh, in resource stocks from 2002 to 2012. Um, and there was an amazing time. But again, it mm-hmm. wasn't straight up. There was many times during that 10-year bull market that we were shaking our heads saying, wow, is this bull market over? But then next next thing you know, it keeps going higher. Um, You're right. So, um, it was a lot of fun. A lot of people made a lot of money, but I think that uh, we're going into exactly the same period. I don't know if we need a stock market crash. Um, um, you know, that's that's up for debate. But um, well, you know, we do definitely need the institutional money to come into the sector. And as I said er- earlier in the interview, that um, they're going to be forced into this sector because they're losing out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when you, um, I have so many things I want to say now because you stimulated so much thought. But when you talk about the valuations in the in the general markets, <clears throat> I'm an old accountant, so I like to compare. You know, what do I get for each dollar that I put into first mining gold stock? What do I get for each dollar that I put into first majestic stock or any, almost any of the mining stocks now? For every dollar you put in, you're generally getting at least a dollar or more of assets. And if you compare that to every dollar that you put into NVIDIA or every dollar that maybe you put into Apple or Microsoft, maybe with those companies you're getting a nickel or two or three cents worth of assets and a lot of hope and a lot of promises that they're going to deliver big profits in the future. I mean, the the entry point, in my opinion, and I'm not a financial advisor, not giving financial advice, but in my opinion, the entry point in the mining sector right now is incredible. I know first mining gold, if you if you if you kind of break down the 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 market cap and divide it by the number of ounces of gold that the company has in Canada, I mean, it works out to seven or six dollars per ounce of gold. It's it's just incredible right now. Yeah, yeah, that's very very true. And um, you know, I think investors probably don't realize how important these two assets are. You know, there there's uh, you know there's a variety of million ounce assets around, and uh, you know, a million ounce gold asset you know is is not that uncommon. Uh, mm-hmm. Whether it's in Mexico or 
or or the United States somewhere, or so in Nevada, or or you know in Canada, British Columbia, Ontario, or Quebec, or whatever. You know, there's probably a couple of dozen you know um, um, that are around that you could probably pick up if, if you're so inclined. But the majors don't want those million ounce assets. You know, yeah. They want five million ounce assets. That's kind of their number, and and because they need it, they need a mine that's going to produce you know two hundred fifty, three hundred. 400, 500,000 ounces a year to, to make a dent on their cash flows. You know, they need yeah. big assets. For them to, you know, build a mine for a billion dollars is nothing if, if it's going to produce, you know, three to 500,000 ounces a year. Um, uh, you know, as I said earlier, you know, there's no other company on earth that I'm aware of that has two very large projects like this in their portfolio. And being in the jurisdictions that they're in, you know, one being Quebec, one being Ontario, this is highly unique. Um, so mm -hmm. for any of these majors who are looking around, um, you know, th this is a company, these are two assets that uh, they just have to look at. Yeah, yeah. And and uh, there just aren't that many. I know there's a, a, a graph on the first mining investor presentation. There's just a handful of other projects that size in Canada. And earlier, you mentioned about the fact that the company is burning through some cash. But I think it's important to point out that, yes, but these are big, big, big projects. So they're going to take more manpower. They're going to take more work. Um, and there's very few projects in that area that are as advanced through the permitting process uh, as what we see at Spring Pole and, uh, and Du Parquet. So, uh, yeah. Keith, thank you so much for joining me today. I, I will, will be remiss if I don't mention that if people want to learn more about the company, they can go to the website. Or um, I think you know a guy who works at the company named Paul Morris, who they can reach out to as well. Paul's been a longtime friend of mine and, uh, uh, you know, great guy. And uh, uh, she's, when I say long time, it's probably like 30 years. So he's, uh, I'm, I'm so happy he's on board. And, uh, you know, for those who would like to chat with him please reach out and uh you know we'll definitely connect you but um yeah look, on a podcast like this it's difficult to really get into you know all the nuances you know there's lots of moving parts and there's uh, a lot of effort going into the development of both of these assets and uh, uh i can tell you the team is very focused and um you know these assets in my view will become producing gold mines both of them and even even gold on uh, uh you know, treasure metal you mentioned and uh you know, Hope Brook, which uh, um, um, uh, the other company owns, what was it? Forget Big that. Ridge. Big Ridge, sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they, they'll, I, I, I'm, I'm glad you knew that because they would give me shit if I didn't uh, <laughs> I, like, I at least know their name. And then, of course, yeah. Cameron, 100% owned it. Uh, so, look, we got a great portfolio, a lot of energy going behind the company. It's just it hasn't shown up in the stock, uh, but I'll, I'll continually buy it and, and uh, others, I'm sure, will come in. Well, we'll be in uh, Europe next week, uh, meeting investors, and um, um, you know the interest is increasing, which is nice. Yeah, to see. yeah. Well, you know, you know, we we've all all of us have always heard the saying, "Actions speak louder than words." So you and I have shared a lot of words today about the company. Uh, but uh, if you look at publicly available filings, you will see, uh, like Keith uh, mentioned earlier, that he has been actively buying the stock. And uh, I've been actively buying the stock as well. So if we look at what the actions are, it shows that uh, that you continue to have confidence in the management, continue to have confidence in the properties. And uh, it'll be exciting to see how things develop here in the coming uh, months and years and uh, especially if we get uh, uh, even the slightest continued improvement in the overall uh, gold equities market, uh, I think we could be in for some real fun, exciting times. Keith, thank you for joining me here in the basement, and uh, I'll look forward to seeing you next time. Well, it's a great time, a great, great opportunity to speak to you again, Ron, and particularly on a day like today when uh, you know, we have, a, I think, silver prices are up like 80 cents, which is highly unusual. Uh, gold gold's up 20 bucks it's been up i think gold's been up 20 dollars a day for the last week or something yeah so, yeah yeah I, I mean i was just talking to my wife Susie, who's over the last couple of years she helps with the channel and she's uh now she watches the gold and silver price and she said what's going on with gold and i i told her i said i've noticed and i think it's a really good thing like the last few days 
it's shot up overnight, kind of in the morning, and then it almost comes back to being even, and then uh, like strength comes back into the market, it goes back up. It really feels like uh, a different market than what we had a year or two ago. Uh, and I, you know, I guess before I wrap up, I'll just I'll, I'll show you this, Keith, because uh, you talked about you know kind of the differences in the GDXJ and the gold silver price. I, I explicitly remember the last two Easter Sundays, Easter Sunday of 2022, Easter Sunday of 2023, where my mining stock portfolio had hit like a recent all-time high, right? And then immediately fell back. So I did some analysis, and that was indeed the case. Uh, uh, the GDXJ, uh, Easter of 2022, was at 51 US dollars per share, immediately dropped to 30. Um Last year, the GDXJ had come back then to 42, immediately again dropped back to 30. Same thing with the gold and silver price. And um, I'm thinking that this year, I'm hoping that we broke the Easter curse because it uh, feels like these first few days we're, we're, we're continuing to show strength in the metals and the equities prices. You know, that's a super good point, Ron, because uh, this time of year between March to May is usually kind of a weaker era, weaker period. Uh, mm -hmm. that's, you know, usually, and then you go back 30 years and look at the charts, usually your strong period is from kind of October to February or, or September to February or whatever. Uh, and then it gets weak uh, for a few months into the summer. And then it starts picking up again at the end of August and then end into October, November, December. Um, and, and and you can almost bank on it. And, and, and a lot of people trade around that as well. Um, um, uh, I don't particularly pay that much attention to it, but I just look at charts. And uh, uh, but this time around, it's not the same. Um, you know, we have a different kind of market. There's a uh, there's a bit out there um, coming mm -hmm. into the sector, and uh, it's something something's changing. And uh, I think there's going to be a flush of capital coming into the mining sector over the next couple of years. Yeah, it'll be it'll be exciting. I saw a political cartoon the other day. It had China on one side. A big wall in the USA on the other, and the Chinese were throwing bundles of U.S. dollars over the wall, and the U.S. was shipping over silver and gold. So, who, who knows? You know, <laughs> a real simplistic way to look at things. Yeah, well, you know, it, it's um, you know, there there was an interview that was done, and then you know, I don't want to really plug a, another channel, but um, oh, you're fine. By by Frank Justra and uh, Pierre. Yeah. Song. Uh, they did a roundtable discussion last week um, with Michelle. Um, I got Michelle from side. Kitco. That's right, from Kitco. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was quite fascinating. And then uh, I've s s said similar things uh, as well, but they were they were very concise and they they really laid it out on what's happening in the institutional world and and the pension fund world and uh, yeah and, and how these big groups are not invested in the sector at all. And uh, it kind of, kind of goes back to what I said earlier. And uh, I would I would suggest to your listeners that they try to find that on on YouTube and listen to it. It's quite fascinating. Yeah, yeah. I listened to the the first part of that last night before I went to bed, and it, it, exactly right. Like, there's just no money in this sector, and you know, as you've already said, like just the smallest amount could could make a huge difference. So we'll be uh, we'll be keeping our eyes out and. Uh, uh, really looking forward to next time, uh, Keith, that we can have you back in the basement. And I also want to throw in, I will put a link to Paul Morris uh, to his email address in the description of this for anybody who wants to reach out. Uh, Paul, like Keith said, is a great guy, very friendly. Uh, you can actually talk to somebody at First Mining Gold if you want to learn more about the opportunity. Thanks a lot, Keith. I hope you have a great, uh, a great rest of your day. Great. And thanks again, Ron. Appreciate it.